the Disney Channel presents Comedy Tonight. Jackie Gleason's Cavalcade of Characters. Hosted by Paul Reiser. I'm Paul Reiser, and this is Jackie Gleason's Cavalcade of Characters. For more than 40 years, Jackie made us laugh with characters and performances that set a standard of excellence for television. I've been a Jackie Gleason fan my whole life. In fact, some of my earliest television memories are of The Poor Soul and the great Reggie Van Gleason, and of course, The Honeymooners. Gleason's characters gave us some of the best moments television has ever known. And what is especially remarkable is that everything you were going to see was performed live. And it's all from Jackie's first year as host of the old Dumont Network's Cavalcade of Stars. The year was 1951. The Druggists of America present... In cooperation with the National Association of Retail Druggists... Gleason only hosted Cavalcade for one season before moving to CBS. But what a year it was. It was the beginning of a television legacy. I don't mind a springtime. I don't mind a fall. I don't mind a winter. I don't mind at all. Everything about Jackie Gleason was bigger than life. And there's no better example of the outrageous side of Jackie than Reggie Van Gleason. <laughs> Reginald Van Gleeson III was always full of style and full of himself, ready to toss an insult at anybody and everybody. The sketch that you're about to see was one of the first appearances Reggie made on television. The character became such an instant success that later that season, Reggie the character was almost nominated as TV Digest's Television Entertainer of the Year. And take a look at Reggie's father. See if you don't recognize him from another one of the show's great sketches. Be a way, there must be a way. Emily, we have got to do something about our son, Reggie. I, I don't know what to do. Uh, we tried to disown him. That didn't work. I sent him away. He came back. I... Emily. Maybe there's a loophole in his birth certificate. But Frederick, Frederick's behavior has been improving all along. Improving? Yes. How can you say that, my dear? Improved. By last night, he stole a construction truck, used the cement.
cement mixer to mix cocktails. Now, Cedric, he's trying to be a good boy. He even got himself a hobby. Confecting antiques. Fine antiques. Bottles of 20 and 30 year old stock. <laughs> I tell you, my dear, his conduct is deferred. Have you forgotten just this last Halloween? After having some freaks, he and a few of his old cronies went down the subway and bent some of the tracks. Now, the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria is a stop on the BMT. <laughs> Cedric, this situation is not entirely hopeless. I have a surprise for you. Hey, a surprise? Yes. Freddie has become a scout master. A scout master? Yes. What a shame. And they were getting along so well. <laughs> Mr. Reginald has come home. Oh. Yeah, hello, Dad. Deal. <laughs> You're mine, all mine. <laughs> I need you every day. I need you every way. You're mine, all mine. <laughs> Babe, it's jolly boy. I need you today. Always. Be prepared. <laughs> May I help you across the street? Mm -hmm. Let everybody move. Right. Fresh tracks. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. My good deed for the day. <laughs> See now? Right here. Oh, Reginald, well, what are you rearranging all the furniture for? I forgot to tell you, dear old dad of mine. <laughs> I'm expecting some cubs from my troop. Oh, is it a stop, We're having a meeting. I'm not so sure it's so lovely. <laughs> The members of the Stunt Patrol have arrived. <laughs> Sprinkle some cologne on them and send them in. Upstanding youth. <laughs> dear old mom, dear old dad. May I introduce you to a few cubs? Roger Roulette, step forward. This is the winner of the Archery Award. Last summer, he shot a grape off his brother's head. His brother would have been 38 tomorrow. Goodbye. Charlie, check room. Step out. Mmm, <laughs> boy. This is a young man who was wounded in a sham battle. Cut his lip drinking from a can of beer. Sit back. Benjamin Breadstick. <laughs> mm, boy. 
Last year, at the Aquatic Festival, this young man won the Amphibian Award. Stayed underwater for 17 hours. 17 hours? How did he live? It's obvious, he didn't. <laughs> now, for our class, first day, Benjamin Brinstick, step forward. We shall now study head injury. <laughs> now, in applying the bandage, you bring it around the head thusly. Putting it down, bringing it around. Straight through, over the cranium, under the chin, above the ear, sideways, letting it go off the shoulder, thusly. <laughs> How do you feel now? Fine, it's you. As you know, the temperature in the forest changes quite rapidly, going sometimes from sub-zero temperatures to even lower. So it is necessary for you all to know how to build a fire in big time. Now a good camper builds a fire, collects wood in 30 seconds. On your feet, men. Axes out. Geronimo! Another meeting tomorrow night. Oh, I guess. those of you scoring at home, yes indeed, that was Art Carney as Reggie's father. It's incredible that everything was done live back in 1951. The orchestra was live, even, even the laughter was live. So if a joke or a sketch missed the mark, the audience simply didn't laugh. But that was not a frequent problem with Jackie Gleason on the stage. Here's another example why. Jackie Gleason had a great appreciation for silent physical comedy, inspired by the likes of Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. Now, the character called The Poor Soul was Gleason's purest expression of his love for physical comedy. The Poor Soul in Central Park was the very first time this character ever appeared on television. Now, Jackie Gleason also had the good sense and the good fortune to choose another of television's all-time funniest men to be a regular on the cavalcade of stars, Art Carney. Certainly best known as Ed Norton in The Honeymooners. Take a look now at The Poor Soul.
Now, keep in mind, the Cavalcade of Stars was a variety show. So, in addition to the sketches, there were guest stars and dance numbers and specialty acts, like jugglers and trained dogs. They had dogs that were trained. Sometimes Jackie, who had a hand in everything from set design to choreography, he would also do the specialty act. Now, in the next piece, it's Jackie Gleason, the magician. And remember, this is all live, and it's practically unrehearsed.
The man is amazing, running from sketch to sketch with wardrobe changes and an hour of dialogue to remember. And he hated to rehearse. I mean, he really hated to rehearse. Of course, Gleason had a true photographic memory, so he could learn an entire script at one glance. See, he believed that too much rehearsal would make the actors stale, that their performances would be flat. But not every sketch or every character worked for Jackie. Sometimes the scene was too slow or the character was unsympathetic. The next character that you're going to see was called The Bachelor. It's another silent character and one that Gleason did a lot when the series began. Maybe The Bachelor was just too similar to The Poor Soul, or maybe Jackie just decided not to have two pantomime characters. But slowly, The Bachelor disappeared from Jackie's show, and we were lucky to find this rare footage of that character in the Museum of Broadcasting in New York.
As a teenager, Jackie Gleason spent a fair amount of time in pool halls and saloons. That's where he earned his reputation as a hustler. That's also where he got to meet people like Joe the bartender. Fat Joe Fogarty walks up to Bookshelf Robinson and he says, Look, Bookshelf, he says, I hereby challenge you to a cooking contest. And Bookshelf accepts the challenge. Fat Joe says, How about a little bet? Bookshelf says, I never bet. So Fat Joe says, That's on account of you're cheap. Bookshelf says, I am not cheap. And with that, he takes out a $5 bill, puts a match to it, and lets it burn to a crisp. Fatso says, that don't faze me in the least. So he takes out a $10 bill, puts a match to it, and lets that burn to a crisp. And then Bookshelf Robinson really showed he had class. He takes out his checkbook, writes out a $300 check, puts a match to it, and burns it up. Gleason spent a lot of hours with a bartender who acted as sort of a surrogate father for him, and that man became the model for the character of Joe the bartender. Gleason once said that everyone Joe talked about was a real person. And this really isn't a sketch. It's sort of Jackie's clever way of doing a monologue. See, Gleason didn't like telling jokes, but by making the stories personal to the likes of Mr. Moriarty and Fatso Fogarty, he was able to put them into a warm and familiar setting. <laughs> Mr. Dunahee, come on in. Hey, Mr. Dunahee, you should have been here a minute ago. There was a traveling salesman in here, and he showed me a little experiment. And it only goes to prove everything I have said all my life is right. Look at this. Oh, what you have? Same thing coming up. Yeah, the pipes are broke again. <laughs> hey, up, pal. Now, get a load of this experiment, Mr. Dunahee. Look, I take two glasses. I take a glass of water, and I take a glass of booze. Now, I pour water in one glass, and I pour booze in the other glass. Now, I take a wine. This was a very nice salesman. He left one with me. <laughs> Here it is. Now, I drop this wine in the water, and watch what happens. See him swimming around in there, pal? See, he's laughing and everything, blinking his eyes. And I take them out of the water, and I drop them in the booze. Watch what happens. See it crumbling up? Look. Point to a crisp. And it only goes to prove, Mr. Donahue, he's something I've said all my life. If you drink booze, you'll never have wines. <laughs> hey, where were you last night, Mr. Donahue? You should have been around. The whole mob was in. We are all drinking it up, thinking of the old days. You know, when we were kids. And we're talking about how he used to go to school and everything. And you know, all of a sudden, you know, we used to hate school, but we didn't know how lucky we were. And all of a sudden, all the guys stood up. I'm telling you, there wasn't a dry eye amongst the whole group. And we drank a toast. A toast to the one who sacrificed and worked and slaved to keep us in school, the truant officer. <laughs> I'm telling you, our gang really played hooky. You know, Crazy Guggenheim, he played hooky so often, he didn't know when the school time ended. <laughs> I mean it. He spent the first 10 days of a summer vacation hiding out in a freight car. <laughs> Imagine that 10 days. I spent 14 in there. <laughs> that was really a group. I remember one teacher we had. Miss uh, Shannon, I think her name was. You know, a young one. She was real, you know, big, beautiful redhead, great big blue eyes, cute nose, perfect lips, real good shape. But I don't know. All that and yet, there, there was something I liked about her. <laughs> that was really a tough school, too. That teacher, she was always picking on crazy Guggenheim. Every day she starts to pester him. She says, you forgot your homework. You forgot your lessons. You forgot the shave. She's going at them all the time. <laughs> but they were rough. And I'm telling you, one day the teacher says to Fatso Fogarty, she says, who killed Abe Lincoln? So he says, John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> the next day, all the kids took him for a ride on a county squeal. <laughs> Guggenheim, you know, Rinty Callahan, he was the favorite of the whole school. You know, on account it was so tough, he was voted in his class the most likely to be found dead in an auto court. <laughs> and you know something? Even in those days, Rinty Callahan was a lover. I remember the first time he went around with a little kid by the name of Sadie Schultz, her name was. She was six foot four and he was five foot two. They could only kiss on stairways. 
then he fell in love. He fell in love with a girl in the fourth grade, the teacher of the class, you know. And I think she had a little crush on him too. But they, you know, they couldn't get married or anything on account of the difference in ages. He was three years older than she was. <laughs> Those were the days. And everybody had their favorite subject too, like Moriarty the Undertaker. He took up Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, you know, all the dead languages. <laughs> and crazy Guggenheim. You know, he, you might not believe this, but Guggenheim was the only guy in our bunch who ever skipped a grade. Yeah, he went from the fourth to the second. <laughs> I remember one day at clear graduation day, so the whole gang, you know, she takes us to the zoo. You know, I'm a little outing, there's no more work to do. And we're walking around all the cages and she's pointing into the different animals and asking the kids what's the animals, you know. So she comes to the cage where the deer is, you know, the deer with the horns. She says to Guggenheim, what's in the cage? He says, I don't know what's in the cage. She says, well, what does your mother call your father? He says, don't tell me that that's a skunk. <laughs> oh, by the way, Mr. Dunny, I got some of your tabs here. I... Oh, you got to go? <laughs> okay, Mr. Dunny, be seeing you. Watch out for those swinging doors. Oh, wait a It's hard to believe, but of all the Emmy Awards that Jackie Gleason's TV series won, Jackie himself never got one. However, he did have the pleasure of seeing one of his supporting stars get recognized a number of times. As a supporting actor, Art Carney showed extraordinary versatility, and nothing shows it better than his portrayal of Clem, the shy and quiet best friend of loudmouth Charlie Bratton. What would you say that is? <laughs> Looks like a picture of an Egyptian girl. That's what you say. Watch this. <laughs> Never see that on television. We've all known somebody like Charlie Bratton. He's a good guy. He's just too loud and too pushy and just a little, little too much of everything. In this sketch, Charlie Bratton comes to visit his pal Clem in the hospital. Take a look.
What's the matter? You want me to put that on right? Well, I don't know. Well, certainly. This is ice cream tubes. It's supposed to be cracked ice. <laughs> Here, let me fix that for you. I'm going to sit down there a little bit. There you are. Hurry, will you cut it out? Well, stay on. Well, I bought you some books. Hey, you are. It's fun to be sick. 500 diseases America loves. <laughs> I'll remove your appendix at home in your spare time. <laughs> Shelly, what does the doctor think it is? I don't know. I don't know, and I don't even think he does. He's giving me pills all day long. In the morning, I take an orange pill. In the afternoon, a red one. In the evening, a yellow one. Well, whatever you got, you got it in Technicolor. <laughs> Charlie, what is it, pal? It's time for my medicine. Will you hand me that bottle over there? Sure. On the table. What's that slap? It's the medicine he's been giving me in between the pills. Oh, I see. Well, he thinks I got a floating kidney. A floating kidney? Yeah. Well, there's only one thing for a floating kidney, you know. What? An outboard motor. <laughs> Give me a teaspoon full of that, will you, Charlie? All right. Like a good fellow. Hey, the spoon's dirty. Got to be sanitation here, you know, in a hospital. Yeah. What do you get, about a spoon full of it? Just get one You know, I want to tell you. The trouble with you is that you're anemic. If you shaved and cut yourself, you wouldn't bleed. You'd get an IOU. <laughs> Just drink that right down. <laughs> What else has been going on while I've been away? Oh, nothing much. Nothing you know much, the eh? way it is here, Charlie. Yeah, a little quiet, I suppose. Get to sleep and they wake you up. And... <laughs> <laughs> then you wake you up and get you to sleep again, I suppose. Well, they could go on and on. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Say, what's that thing? That's a doctor's bag. He was here a little while ago. He's coming back in a minute. I think I'll have a little look at you myself. Oh, wait a minute, Charlie. You're no doctor. I never told you this, Clem. But I took two years of medical school and would have been one of America's finest surgeons, except for one thing. What's that? I can't sew. Ha! Ha! <laughs> now, where's that thermometer? Oh, here it is. Open your mouth, Clem. That's it. Either I'm deaf or you're dead. Let's see now. Hey, your tongue's all blue. So it is. <laughs> the joke's on me. I put a fountain pen in your mouth instead of a thermometer. <laughs> Let me look in your left ear. Now, wait. Oh! What do you see, Charlie? Your right ear. <laughs> <laughs> you know something, pal? It's a good thing I come over tonight. You might not have lasted till tomorrow night. What do you mean? I have here in my pocket a bottle of Hiawatha's Magic Elixir. <laughs> there it is, pal, and I'm going to let you have it for exactly what I paid for it, $30. Look, Charlie, I haven't got $30 to pay you. I can't. There's a $15 deposit on the bottle. Look, I don't have the money, Charlie. The boss sent my paycheck to my wife, and she hasn't cashed it yet. Oh, she's cashed your check, all right. Whoops. <laughs> Saw Mildred and she cashed the check? Well, now, Clem, don't get upset. You know, since you've been in here, she feels kind of lonely, so uh, she took a little money out of your check and ran a party for the whole gang last night over the house. <laughs> Boy, everybody was hooting and howling and screaming and yelling. <laughs> the drinks were flowing back and forth. Boy, she sang a couple of songs, did a few dances. The whole thing ended up in a pie-throwing contest, and she won first prize. She hit your picture every time. <laughs> you know that picture in the living room? Yeah. You now have lemon meringue ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta get back to the office, Clem. Yeah? What's There's, new uh, back there? A new redhead working there. New redhead? What's she doing? She's got your job. Boss is crazy about it, too. Oh, by the way, he told me not to tell you not to hurry back. Well, I gotta be off. Thanks. You, you read these books now, Clem. Yeah, listen, on your way out, will you get that nurse in here to change these sheets? You got the medicine and everything all over it. 
I have other plans if I run into that nurse. <laughs> Just want to change the sheet? I know how to do this. Don't move the patient an inch. Know exactly how to do it. Now, you just stay there, Clem. Don't let anything bother you. Now, you got to get a firm grip on the sheet. Lift it up. <laughs> Boy, Clem, you sure are funny looking down there. Better get an anchor for your floating kidney. You just floated out of bed. Hello, ah! ah, ah! Clem. Be a pleasure to see you. Bye, pal. Someday I'm going to kill that man. Being loud and occasionally obnoxious was a Gleason trademark. See, what Jackie liked doing best in his nightclub act was having the chance to talk directly to the audience, or actually insulting them was the better way of putting it. So when Jackie created Rudy the Repairman, he found the perfect character to do the same kind of comedy. Rudy, Rudy is a man with almost no redeeming values. Except one. He made a whole lot of people laugh. <laughs> well, I guess it's all fixed. Fixed? Turn the set off. I don't know what... Every week, Gleason would produce an hour of live comedy and music that demanded an incredible amount of physical energy and timing and, and good luck, basically. With so many costume and character changes and, and sight gags and music cues, it's really, it's a wonder that he pulled it off week after week. This next classic Rudy the Repairman sketch is just another example of how ambitious the production of Cavalcade of Stars really was in the early days of television. Concentrating, I haven't slept in over a week. Oh. It's that confounded mouse running around inside our wall here. If I've told you once, I'll tell you another. I know about... what you're gonna say, dear. I called that repairman early this morning. I don't know why he hasn't come. Now, you see? See, there's that mouse again. Ah, oh, dear, I think that's the door. What? I think oh. that's the door. Just a minute, now. Don't you dare be impatient with me. Hello? Uh, You gonna catch the mouse? What were you expecting, a cat? <laughs> hey, Whitey! Hey, come on! Come on in. <laughs> All right, come in. Oh, now, uh, if you'll bring us up to date on the activities of this road, we'll get on with the mouse hunt. Well, we've we've had a mouse running around inside our wall for about a month. I I tried to catch him myself, but I didn't have any luck. Tried to catch him yourself, huh? The amateurs that work again. Stuck up nonsense. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Look, pal, uh, can you tell us the area he's operating from? Well, yes, yes, just follow me this way. This is the area I believe he's operating. There's the hole he comes right out. Right there, huh, pal? Clear this area. Move over there. All right, lady, get that out of the way. Oh, All right. Oh, I'm so hey, right here, down a direct line. There it is. Hey, right young there. Just, just a minute. What are you doing? I'm making a fake mouth hole. What? We chase the mouse out of there. He scoots across the room, thinks this is the way out. Bam! Into the wall, fractured skull. Hey, Whitey. <laughs> Let's see now. This is a job for Lillian. We'll set up the apparatus right here. Look, pal. Will you get out of the way? We're very busy. Right, I tried to help. All right, just put it down there, pal. I'll give you the signal, Roger. You know, you let it go. Hey, you and the lady move that. You're out of the way. Yeah. Different air. 
I love Sammy Dale. Hey, pal, take this. It's no secret that Jackie Gleason's childhood was less than perfect. 
overweight and overprotected by a zealous mother, he was often the target of ridicule by his classmates. And maybe that's why he could understand and have sympathy for wonderful characters like Fenwick. came out quite right for Fenwick, but Jackie brought him back week after week to bring us a little bit of laughter. In this sketch, it's actually a great deal of laughter. I'll tell you what radio needs if it's going to compete with television. It's realism, more realism. That's the only way we can compete with television. Realism and more realism. Austin, you're right. I know it. Why, on television, even the dummies are realistic. You're right. Take Kukla and Ali, Jerry Mahoney, Lucky Pup, Jackie Gleason. Why, they all look almost human. Hey, where is that confounded sound effect man, Fenwick Babbitt? I told him to be here about a half an hour. <laughs> Me too. Oh, there you are. You finally, lazy, good for nothing, no good jellyfish backbone, lousy bum. You a nice man. <laughs> where have you been and what have you been doing? I was up in the Studio 8. I was the head shusher on the program. Said, shush. Yeah, you know, when the girl squeezes the bottle of heat, I go, shh. Now listen to me, Fenwick Babbitt. During our program today, you and your sound effects, I want you to strive for realism. I can't stress this point too strongly. Let's have more realism. All right, let's get on with the show. You're a nice man. Rancho, America's finest cracker, presents Orson Poole in another in a series of real-life murder mysteries entitled... Death and be fatal. <laughs> but first, a word about Cruncho. You know, Cruncho's come in that easy to open package. All you do is zip it open, and they taste so good. Just try one. Once you taste Cruncho's, you can't stop. You just eat one after another. And now, back to Death and be fatal. <laughs> good evening. This is Orson Poole speaking. The case I'm going to tell you about involves a policeman named Cooper who stole a herring. Or, as, as it was known to my friend Sam Spade, the copper Cooper Kipper Caper. <laughs> it all started one night when I was sitting in my office. It was raining pretty hard outside. As a matter of fact, it was raining cats and dogs. <laughs> when all of a sudden, all of a sudden the phone began to ring. This could only mean bad news to me. You see, the phone was located in a candy store across the street. I had to make a decision fast, so I decided to answer it. I opened the door to my office, and I ran down the steps. I got down one flight, but I remembered I forgot my gun, so I ran up the steps again. Opened the door, went into my office. I grabbed my gun, ran down the steps again to answer the phone. I ran down two flights and out the door. And then suddenly I noticed something. The phone had stopped ringing. By now the rain had become a cloudburst. The streets were flooded. I had to wade my way back. <laughs> then I reached the building opened the door, and went back up the stairs. <laughs> Something told me there was trouble up there, and I'd better hurry. Sure enough, when I opened the door, there was a beautiful doll standing there. She was wearing jewelry by Coro, and loved that red lipstick. She was a slick-looking chick, so I walked right up to her, looked her up and down, and decided to plant a big kiss on her luscious lips. <laughs> 
<laughs> he didn't seem to like it, because the next thing I knew, she slapped my face. I suddenly knew that something was wrong. Sure enough, I turned around quickly, and there was her boyfriend opening the door slowly. <laughs> he looked like a raving maniac and was coming at me with a knife. Something told me there was going to be trouble, and I started to draw my gun. But before I could draw it, the dame cut me over the head with a bottle. There was nothing to do. <laughs> nothing to do but get rough myself. And then the battle started. He was tough. Nothing seemed to hurt him. So I hit him with another vase. <laughs> and then I started to run. He started after me. I ran round and round the room. Round and round I went. And then he caught me. He hit me with a second vase. And then I started to run again. Faster, around the room, faster, faster, faster. I could see this wasn't the way to handle him, so I stopped. <laughs> I decided to get it over with. I got him in a hammerlock, and I picked him up and threw him down on the floor. <laughs> it was either him or me, so I picked him up and I threw him out the window. <laughs> In a moment, I was listening. There was a knock on the door. And then a voice cried, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. And he broke the door down. There was only one thing to do. I picked him up and I threw him out the window. <laughs> Once again, I heard a knock, a loud knocking on the door. Again, a voice cried, I'm coming in, I'm coming in, and he broke down the door. <laughs> but stamina, there was only one thing to do, and I did it. I picked him up, and I threw him out the window. <laughs> Once again, I stood there, and I listened. All of a sudden, I heard a knocking, a knocking on the door, and another voice cried, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. And sure enough, he broke down the door. How was that? Are you, Sam? Shut up! This was only a dress rehearsal! Oh, you nice man. No look back at the great work of Jackie Gleason would be complete without the honeymooners. Jackie came to the Cavalcade of Stars with a few characters that he did in his nightclub act, and he had a lot of great new ideas, but the honeymooners was not one of them. In fact, Gleason had been hosting Cavalcade for almost a year before he came up with the idea of doing some sort of domestic sketch. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, there are a lot of changes over the years. Art Carney went from neighborhood cop to Ralph's best friend, Ed Norton. The role of Alice was actually played by four different actresses, Audrey Meadows, Sue Ann Langston, and Sheila McRae. But back on October 5th, 1951, Perk Kelton and Jackie Gleason did the first of the many wonderful honeymooner skits. Here's a quick look at a few of the highlights from that first year. Oh, I'm serious, all right. I was never more serious in all my life. I don't think you ever were in love with me. You were just in love with my uniform. <laughs> Wait a minute, where you come on? Ain't you gonna fix my lunchbox for tomorrow? Hey, come on. I could have had manicured nails, and I could have had fancy clothes. But I didn't throw my money away on anything foolish like that. No, sir. I took what little money I had and got a twin burial plot for us. Alice, you got to go. I know you don't want me around after that. Uh, Sorry. I hope you forgive me. Ralph. Yeah? I not only forgive you, I thank you. You thank me? It might sound a little corny, but not every woman has a husband who's still jealous of her after 12 years of married life. Maybe you look great. Jackie Gleason was a star for my entire lifetime, and he will remain one for generations to come. He had the energy and the ingenuity of a hundred performers. 
It's hard, it's actually impossible, to think of a comedian who had more impact on television than Jackie Gleason. He was, is, and always will be the great one. <laughs> Disney Channel. Unlock a briefcase full of blues. So with co-creator of the Blues Brothers.